Hello and welcome back to Business Matters of the Hindu with me, K. Bharat Kumar. Last week, we saw a few things that we should watch out for and which could change momentum for India. In this episode, let's look at the first of those, that's the Indian economy itself. There are a few macroeconomic indicators that we've not touched upon in a few months and it's always good to revisit those once in a few months. And there are some bright spots, there are some dark corners. Let's see what's working and where, you know, we might need to see more data before we make up our minds. The first piece of data we will look at is a private sector survey. This is released monthly. So as per the SNP Global Purchasing Managers Index, the manufacturing sector did pretty well in December, with new orders rising at the fastest pace since February 2021. Interestingly, the selling prices for products outpaced input costs for the first time in two and a half years, and that's good news for manufacturers. The PMI reading rose to 57.8 from November's 55.7 reflecting what S&P Global called a robust improvement in the health of the sector that was the best seen since October 2020. For the October to December quarter, the PMI averaged 56.3, the highest in a year. For context, a reading above 50 on the PMI indicates expansion in business activity levels, and a reading below 50 indicates a contraction. And if the reading is at 50, then there's been no change at all. Surveyed companies continued to add jobs for the 10th month in a row, but the pace of addition was the slowest since September. At the end of this episode, we will look at another source of jobs data and see how we've fared as a country. Among the several macroeconomic indicators that are available to us and which we should all be looking at to help us understand where we are as an economy, the goods and services tax is an important one. Why? Because the GST is a form of indirect tax that contributes to the government's kitty and helps fund several social initiatives by the government. Not only have GST collections shown consistent growth in recent times, but in terms of absolute value for 10 consecutive months, they've come in in excess of rupees 1.4 lakh crore. In a print report in our newspaper earlier this week, we quote KPMG as saying that rupees 1.5 lakh crore per month may be the new normal because the December figures, which were almost 1.5 lakh crore, came after the festival season and festival buying had ended. Next, we come to core sector data. What are the core sectors? This is a collection of eight sectors like steel, cement, power generation, and so on, that are indicative of economic progress. They contribute 40% of the index of industrial production. But here, there has been no trend that you can take away. If you look at monthly figures starting from April, you see that November, for instance, the latest available data, we bounced back with about 5.4% growth. October was a shocking 0.9% anemic, weak growth. Starting from April, we had seemingly good growth for three months compared with the year earlier, but because of the low base effect, these growth figures could have seemed robust because the base effect was caused in the year 2021 when the country was laid low by a pandemic. Then coming back to this year's data, after April, May, June, we had two months of a dip September, we bounced back again. October, like I said, we went down and November is back up again. Even within November, if you look at data for each of these subsets, the eight sectors, there has been no trend that you can take away. There are four sectors that have expanded at double digit growth percentage. And there are three that have contracted, forget growth. Our print report last week on this showed that cement output recovered sharply from a 4.3% contraction in October to jump 28.6% in November while coal and electricity production levels accelerated to 12.3% and 12.1% respectively. Steel output grew at the fastest pace in six months at 10.8%, but production levels were actually lower than in October 2022. The disappointments were in crude oil, natural gas, and refinery output. Refinery products hit a 21-month low. Crude oil shrank for the sixth consecutive month. Natural gas output saw its fifth successive month of contraction. Ratings agency India Ratings offers hope for the month of December, pointing to electricity generation, which has grown about 13% till the 29th of the month. After all, electricity generation is a good proxy for economic growth. Almost all economic activity requires power. The agency also says, encouragingly, that the steel and cement sectors may see good growth in the near term, on the back of sustained capital expenditure support on parts of both the state and the central governments. The next piece of data that you should watch out for is credit growth or loan growth numbers of the Indian banking system. When I say you, 
not just you as an economic student, but any average citizen of the country should watch out for these numbers, it gives us an idea of where we are as an economy. The RBI in its report on trend and progress of Indian banking 2021-22 says that credit growth had rebounded smartly in that period and also helped expand the consolidated balance sheets of the Indian banks. Not only that, but healthy credit growth has also sustained in the first six months of this financial year, April 2022 to September 2022. But there's a qualifier there. Analysts at Bank of America had in October put out a report that pointed out that a low base effect, which we saw earlier in this discussion, and significantly high wholesale price inflation have likely contributed to inflating these numbers. To be sure, WPA has actually come down in the recent past. For November, in mid-December we had data on this, for November they came in at 5.88%, which is a 21-month low. So the second half of this year, between October 2022 and March 2023, the data will tell us how we've performed in terms of credit growth. And why is credit growth important? Because when companies see consumption demand from people like you and me, they invest in capital expenditure, they expand their manufacturing facilities and so on. And where do they get the funds in order to be able to invest? From the banking system. So borrowings are a critical part of economic recovery, growth and so on. The monthly data from the RBI also shows that credit growth to the service sector in November was strong and grew some 21%. Loans to industry, grew 13%, while agriculture mopped up close to 14% in that month. Interestingly, auto and housing loans drove personal loan growth of 20%. Significantly, deposits growth has not kept pace with credit growth. For the fortnight ended December 2nd, 2022, deposits grew about 9.9%. In the subsequent fortnight, they actually slipped down a bit, growing only at 9.4%. Credit growth in both of these fortnights has kept in the 17.5% growth range. Why are deposits important? We saw earlier in this discussion why credit growth is important. But deposits contribute in a significant manner to the funds that banks hold in order to be able to fund their credit growth. But if inflation rates are high, people like you and me would have very little to put in deposits in our bank accounts. Inflation has been higher than the RBA's tolerance level of 6% from January to October of this year. Only in November, they came down slightly below 6, about 5.88%. And if banks don't get funds in order to be able to fund their credit growth, then they become constrained for capital. Then one of the things that they could do is go back to the government and say, you know, please recapitalize us. And believe me, that's something that most banks don't want to do. So it's important that RBA keeps its focus on reigning in inflation. And this it has attempted to do by raising benchmark interest rates. The other thing that banks could do in order to raise the pace of deposit growth is to be able to offer better interest rates to depositors. Most banks have already started doing that, but you know, the RBA is expecting full transmission of its increases in benchmark interest rates transferred to deposit rates. And that should happen in a matter of time is the belief for most economists. In the trends report of the RBI we referred to earlier in this discussion, RBA makes an interesting point. It has asked banks to guard against slippages on loans because NPAs have come down in recent times, the balance sheets of banks have all been cleaned up, so it's easy to fall into temptation and allow NPAs to fester. This brings us to another interesting question. Just because balance sheets are all cleaned up, it's easy for banks to fall prey to temptation and start taking more risks in terms of the projects that they lend to. How does one prevent this or how does a central bank actually spot this and fend it off or nip it in the bud? The RBA itself has answered this question. Begin quotes, robust bank profitability is an indicator of a healthy financial system, which augurs well for financial stability. An alternative view is that high profitability could loosen leverage constraints and lead to more risk taking. Empirical estimates for India suggest the existence of a threshold beyond which higher bank profitability may be detrimental to financial stability. The net interest margin of scheduled commercial banks at 2.9% at end March 2022 remained much below the threshold. Close quotes. And RBI has made a statistical study to arrive at 5% NIM or net interest margin as a threshold value. Beyond 5% is when the risks begin to grow. Before we wind down this discussion, let's look at jobs data, something I referred to earlier in this conversation. 
Employment seems to have been India's Achilles heel for some time now. Early last month, the government had talked about data from its Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme showing that demand for such employment was declining, which meant that other forms of consistent employment were taking root. Just as we were beginning to get our hopes high, came data last Sunday from the Center for Monitoring Indian Economy, CMIE, that showed that December saw unemployment at 8.3%, which is a 16-month high. Urban unemployment touched 10%. So these are a clutch of some macroeconomic indicators. Obviously, because of constraints of time, we can't look at everything that's available. But these are good indicators. As and in when we see a blip, a spike, or something that's touched a trough, we'll come back to you and share those pieces of data with you. That's all we have for now this week. Have a lovely week ahead. Meet you again next week.